All right, so welcome everybody to our first monthly webinar of 2022. We are going to make sure that uh, this year it's lined up with very interesting and relevant topics. So please feel free to send me um, any topics that you'd like to chat about, obviously relevant to the community schemes, uh, arena or industry. Um, of course, if there's anything more exciting than community schemes, you are more than welcome to share it, but I don't believe so. I think we really are in the most interesting area of uh, the law and most certainly the most interesting area when it comes to human beings, because that's what we're dealing with on a day to day basis. All right, so we're looking forward to, Nicole and myself are looking forward to what this year has to bring. I can really say that since we got started, Nicole, when was it June 2020? Um, we have been growing from strength to strength, and that is all um, thanks to every single one of you that has supported us in one way or another. It's not always about building relationships through our consulting department, and I found more value in these types of engagements and interactions, which I'm really looking forward to continuing with. We are going to be looking at doing one or two physical events in the year going forward. However, with uh, Nicole and my situations with our little ones and working from home and all those fun things, we're quite happy to sit behind a computer screen. Uh, like Shirley said, keep our videos off or on every now and then makes life a heck of a lot easier. We've got a couple of plans and projects for the year ahead. The topic of today being uh, one that we're most certainly going to be looking at uh, quite vividly. The year so okay. short, actually, and we move um, from one month to the next very, very quickly. I find that Doesn't it's a lot of people. Time. Just remember to mute yourself in the background if there is background noise, please. And Nicole, if you can have a look there, who's uh, got some noise behind them and just mute them if possible. I was in the shops yesterday and I see that they're already advertising things for Valentine's Day. And I think, wow, I'd, I've just literally packed away the Christmas things. It's Valentine's Day. And I think I might have even seen some Easter things too. I was going to say, our shop had Easter stuff out already. That's <laughs> insane. Absolutely insane. But that just shows you that if you want to make a change or if you want to embark on a project, you know, there's no time like the present to start. And the year is so short that you really have to put your all into it to really make a difference. And this year, the topic that we're going to be chatting about today is where I'm looking to make a very big difference. Um, pretty much, you know, 80 to 90 percent of our business revolves around the community scheme on but service and disputes, unfortunately. But it is the reality. And if we can make a difference with that, then that is our goal for this year and moving forward. We are going to be elaborating on the topic that we're going to be chatting today when we join uh, Twibby van Marva, who's with us today in the Ultimate Property Management Masterclass. Um, the date of that event is right on the right-hand corner of his screen, if you can see it there, um, and he'll share that with us in a minute or two. Nicole's going to be sharing on the chat function the link that you can just click on to register for the masterclass. There's going to be a couple of um, relevant speakers in the industry that's going to be talking about some really interesting topics, and mine is going to be aimed at managing agents and their role with dispute resolution. Um, the next item, of course, is what I'm sure all of you that is based in Cape Town at least is looking forward to. I know I am. Friday and Saturday from 10 until 2, the Community Scheme Ombud Service is going to be having a training session. For those of you that have asked, it is going to be available remotely via an MS Teams link. The link and in information relating to the physical events um, has been posted on our Facebook page and our LinkedIn page. And Nicole will send the link to both our Facebook page and the LinkedIn page. Page, uh, on the chat function so you can go have a look there that will include the links for the Microsoft Teams events if those links don't work please do not shout and scream at us we're only the messenger but please do contact me and I will do my best to make sure that you do get online even if I have to sit with my computer on my lap when I'm physically at the event with a zoom uh, meeting open for you I'm more than happy to do that the next item and the last item that I'm going to chat about before I hand over to Toby is our newsletter. So those of you that have joined us today will know that we have started a newsletter. The newsletter going forward is going to be the only method of communication for our webinars. So if you're not signed up to the newsletter, please do follow the link that Nicole's going to pop into the chat function now. Um, if you're already on our database, you still have to complete that link for the newsletter. So if you haven't heard from us for a while, it's probably because you haven't signed up for that. So please do that. Ladies and gents, now over to uh, Toby Van Amadwe. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, 
yeah, for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, and I just want to say uh, welcome to everybody this morning. I um, I uh, I really appreciate the time to quickly uh, talk to you about uh, an upcoming event that we are very excited about. Just before I, I get going with that, um, Zelinda, can you see the screen that I'm sharing at the moment? It's a list. Yes, of, I can. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. You share a whole spread. bunch That's of. Not what I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that. Let's try that again. Okay. Of course, when we tested it five minutes ago, it worked. So yeah. <laughs> okay, well, what do you think? That's the correct one. The slideshow. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so um, yeah, before I get going, I just want to say I know it's end of January already, but um, I hope everybody has a wonderful year, and um, yeah, all the best for 2022. I'm also just like. Linda said, excited about what the year holds in. Um, yeah, so, um, Zelinda, uh, yeah, before I get going, I just want to say that, um, Zelinda, I, I, I really appreciate your passion for the industry. And uh, in the little time that I've worked with you and known you, it's amazing what you, uh, what you bring to the industry. And um, today, what I want to quickly talk about is an uh, event that we got involved in um, at the beginning of 2021. Um, we connect you on, like, just uh, before I get go, get, uh, go on, my name is Tuobi van der and I'm a business development manager for We Connect You. And um, at the beginning of 2021, we, um, we partnered with the Real Investor magazine, Real Estate Investor magazine, and we felt it, um, there's a need in the market just to lay a platform to talk about the business of property management. And we came up with a concept called the Ultimate Property Management Masterclass, and um, the goal of it was to create quarterly events where we specifically focus on the business of property management. And um, we started off uh, with small dreams in Feb last year. And fast forward to today, we, we ended up um, hosting with uh, the Remag, in, uh, the Remag um, guys three masterclasses for the year. And we had about 5,000 uh, property management and rental agents uh, uh, registering and a lot of them attending. I think almost 3,000 attended the events last year. And um, we definitely can see this. There's such a big need in the industry for looking at the challenges that property managers are facing, not just the day-to-day -day stuff, but the business of it. So many property managers are working in their business, but not necessarily working on their business. And um, there's so many balls to juggle. And uh, I think the purpose of the property management masterclass is just to focus on how do you run your, your business better? What tools can you apply in your business to, to grow on your terms and become more profitable? So I just want to spend a few minutes just quickly talking about the upcoming event. Um, there are uh, two days in, at the end of Feb. Uh, I, can, I just picked up on the top right corner of my screen, there's dates, and those dates are wrong. So the dates I'm, I'm sharing now um, is the 23rd and the 24th, Wednesday the 23rd and Thursday the 24th of February. It is an online event via Zoom, hosted by Remag and we connect you that's involved as well. The, the main aim of the Property Management Masterclass, you guys, you, uh, Zanani, you can see my screen, eh? Yes, I can. Okay. So the aim of the Masterclass is to address practical solutions to some of the biggest challenges that we see property managers face every day. Um, I'm in a line of work where I work with property managers every single day. And we talk about the challenges they face. And if I can sum it up, it's always four main things. Firstly, compliance. And that's what today's session, the webinar with Zelinda is all about. And I, I heard you guys chatting before the session started today about the New Property Practitioners Act. But compliance is a huge challenge. So that's something we want to address. And that's something we normally address. Manageability is just taking control of your business making sure that no balls drop because we are in the service industry and if we can make sure that our clients needs are addressed and we can manage our better, uh, business better it's a benef benefit for us and our clients scalability is all about growth and um, a lot of property managers are experiencing growth in their business but it's not always growth on their terms it's almost growth that's sometimes out of control which is not a healthy thing because it affects profitability so these are, the, these are the topics that we normally address in our business, in the masterclass. And at the end of last year, our last masterclass focused all about um, the, the business plan that a property manager should have in place for their, for their business. And we asked a few questions for everybody that attended. And 
there's some interesting stats that came out. And one of the things that we asked is what was the growth trajectory in their businesses for the last 12, 18 to 24 months? And it was interesting to note that about 60% of the, of, of the attendees said that they experienced quite a lot of growth in 2020, 2021, even though we're sitting in the middle of a pandemic, which just shows you the resilience of our industry. And that's exciting because um, there's definitely growth in the industry, but that brings about a lot of other challenges. You'll see there's very few that actually had declining growth, declining growth in their business. Then we also asked specifically about profitability because uh, in our game, it doesn't help you just grow. You also need to grow and become profitable. So we asked um, uh, property managers, what are the top three things they would change in their business to become more profitable? And interesting enough, um, the, the biggest need was uh, to grow their client base with new clients. Um, secondly, is to automate their business the, the technology to achieve more and do more with the same amount of time. Um, the third one was 54% said they want to unlock new income streams in their business. And there's quite a number of ways that a property manager can do that if they apply um, certain business practices, but also apply um, certain technologies within their business. And uh, the last one, just to mention, is the, uh, is the is, is customer service, that uh, very often the value of a property manager is questioned, just because uh, our clients often see us as administrators, they don't necessarily see us as valuable asset managers in their business. And that's what we're doing. We, we're managing their most important, important assets, and customer service is critical to that. And then lastly, we asked them, what's your major concerns for 2022? And... Um, the, the one that stood out uh, head and shoulders above everything else was portfolio growth. And that's an interesting one because a lot of clients are experiencing growth, but it's, it's growth that they almost feel is out of control. And um, that's one of the topics that we want to address or some of the topics that we want to address in the water class in February. Customer retention was a big challenge. Um, even though some guys are, are finding growth, on the other side of the coin, we've got clients who find that they are losing clients for whatever reason. And, um, yeah, and then the third, third challenge is competent and qualified staff. And I, I'm sure that all of us can attest to the fact that uh, uh, to keep, to, to recruit quality staff, to keep them um, and to keep them trained is a, is a challenge in our industry. And that's where somebody like Zelinda, that training so much is, is adding a lot of value. So that's just some of the concerns that we picked up in our last session. So um, for the upcoming property management masterclass, it's, it's divided into two days. Um, day one is specifically aimed at property managers like yourselves, um, and all the topics address property management. Day two is normally reserved for rental agents um, who's in the property games. So uh, our topic for this upcoming uh, property management masterclass on the 23rd, it's from 10 to, to 1 on Zoom, and um, our focus is reimagining property management together. Um, and we're going to be looking at practical steps and tools to fast track your growth and profitability in 2022. It's not just about growth, it's about growth and profitability. Yeah, so we're gonna be talking about uh, reimagining the prop, uh, portfolio manager, just focusing on efficiencies that, that can be achieved through best practice uh, procedures. Uh, every day I work with property managers that are struggling to implement best practice procedures. And we're gonna be focusing on some practical aspects there. Then uh, Zalinda specifically is going to focus on reimagining the role of property of the property manager, manager and community dispute resolution. I think it dovetails on today's topic, but we can't wait to hear what um, Zalinda has to say about that. Then we are going to focus on the importance of rock solid arrears processes and practical solutions if you are struggling to do that. Um, we're going to focus on the top three legal pressure points for property managers in 2022. The, the topic of the Property Practitioners Act will definitely be addressed um, in that session. And then we're going to focus on how to gain the competitive edge in your business and position yourself as an expert. We're finding that more and more trustees are, are self-educating themselves. There's a lot of um, uh, resources available. So it's important that you position yourself as an expert in your field. And uh, very often property managers neglect to invest in themselves and to position themselves in the correct way um, in terms of being an expert in this industry. And then lastly, Norma is going to talk to us a little bit about their vision for 2022 and beyond. Just the panelists for the day, um, Donny van der Merwe, uh, director at WeConnect, is going to be, is going to be chatting. 
uh, or presenting one of the, the sessions. Uh, we're very happy to have Zalinda on board for, for, this, for this upcoming one. And she's going to be talking about dispute resolution. Uh, Marina Constance will be joining us. She'll be talking about those legal challenges. Um, I'm going to be talking about the positioning side of, of, of your business, how to position yourself as an expert. Um, we're going to have Vili Ruiz from Stratafin um, talking a little bit about that collection procedures and best practices. And then lastly, uh, Guy Panchakwa, who's the newly elected chairman, chairman, chairman of NAMA. So those are the, um, the panelists that's going to be uh, uh, involved in that day one. And then just lastly, from my side, uh, if you want to register, I think Nicole is going to post the link uh, to the registration uh, in the chat function. So it's just a Zoom link that you can click on to register. And then uh, you can also go to the REMAC website, remac.co.za forward slash events. The event will be up and running on the site, I think, within a day or two. And then lastly, just look out for all our social media channels, um, uh, REMAC, DVDM, you can, you know, also on the Weekend YouTube channel, and everybody that's involved in the day. So guys, um, this is a free event. You know, it doesn't cost you anything. It's just going to cost you a bit of time. Um, it's going to be a fantastic event. We have found a real, real need out there for property managers to, to learn more about the best practice of business. So I um, hope you can join us. Um, if you can't join us that day, register anyway. All the resources will be available afterwards, via video links, and we'll be giving away some practical uh, tools that you can use to address the challenges that we'll be talking about. So yeah, thank you so much, um, Zalinda, for your time. Thank you for the opportunity, and I hope to see you all on the 23rd, 23rd of February. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Toby. Toby, we had a question in the chat function and I answered it. I hope I answered it right. The question was from Vicky. Is the masterclass only for managing agents? I know we chatted yesterday about the main audience uh, being managing yeah. agents, but it is most certainly open for all, not so? Absolutely. Yeah, it's an it's a open event for everybody. You will notice this, the topics are very much aimed at, at uh, property management, um, property management, property managers. So that will be the, the, yeah, the, the topics will be specifically aimed at them, but it's obviously open for everybody. The, the, the audience that the real, real, uh, real estate investor magazine focuses on is everybody. So yeah, it's a very, very broad spectrum of, of people involved in property. So answer is no, everybody, anybody can come and everybody is welcome. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We'll definitely be joining you on both days. We're looking forward to it. And thank you so much for the invitation to be appreciated. We did post the link to the registration um, right at the beginning of the webinar. Nicole's reposted it now as well. So the link is there for you to go and register. Uh, we're going to have it on the recording of the session along with the slides on our website afterwards as well. So if you miss it in the chat function, Go and have a look for it on the website. Yeah. Otherwise, I've also posted We Connect You website details and Toby's email address. Uh, Toby, I wasn't yeah. sure if I was allowed to share your cell phone number, but if you are, uh, you, um, you're welcome. Absolutely. To yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll post it in the, in the chat function. Uh, any part. Great Thank stuff. You. Great stuff. So, firstly, I'd like to say well done, Toby. That those numbers are super impressive. Really, really well done. Um, the first engagement I had with your officers was when I first went back to Pam Golding, and uh, you asked us for a, a meeting, and you came into our offices, and you had your um, demo up for us and me that literally had to figure out where the on and off button was on my MacBook the first day I got it, um, <laughs> was in, I was incredibly impressed and it looked so user-friendly. And since then you have grown um, in leaps and bounds to the point that clients directly, in other words, estates and body corporates make contact of you and basically sometimes even force their managing agents to go with you. <laughs> They're so impressed with it. So that says something that uh, you're not only known to the industry of managing agents, but directly to the managing agents clients as well, which is really fantastic. So those you, dates... Man. Just to confirm is Wednesday the 23rd and Thursday the 24th, the community scheme element of it being on the Wednesday from 10 o'clock until 1 o'clock. Mm. And that information mm. we'll share again as mm. well. Mm. Your comments about uh, staff turnovers and the difficulty of obtaining staff is very, very true. A colleague of mine contacted me literally like two days before Christmas and said as soon as their offices open up, they need a new portfolio manager because the portfolio manager that was supposed to join decided not to anymore. And that's the type of telephone call or message I get so often. Um, so if any of you are interested in becoming portfolio managers, you know who to contact uh, for the training. <laughs> 
uh, and connect you most certainly would uh, be able to put you in touch with a couple of uh, interested managing agents as well. So there's definitely work for portfolio managers and portfolio administrators as well. So the topic that we're going to be chatting about today is internal dispute resolution versus the CSOS. So we know in terms of the Community Scheme Ombud Service Act and the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act that when you have a dispute in a community scheme, not only sectional title, but homeowners association, share block, uh, Shirley Slubbett retirement developments as well, um, you have to, well, not necessarily have to, but uh, you can go to the Community Scheme Ombud Service for that dispute resolution. When the legislation first came out, a lot of attorneys were debating whether or not um, the legislation with the usage of the word may meant that you needed to go to the community scheme on but service in the case of a dispute or if you could still go to court. We have later found out through case law that when there is a dispute in a community scheme, you must use the internal dispute resolution proceedings. And that means that you must go to the community scheme on but service provided that the dispute falls within one of the categories in terms of section 39 of the community scheme on but service act that the community scheme on but service and its adjudicators can deal with. Now, my opinion of uh, dispute resolution through the Community Scheme Ombud Service has always been a very positive one. Uh, just a reminder that if there is any background noise on your side, just to mute yourself. Um, yeah, so my experience and my view on Community Scheme Ombud Service dispute resolution has always been a very positive one. As many of you will know, um, during our time with Professor Graham Paddock, Nicole and I worked very closely with the Community Scheme Ombud Service staff, even before the legislation came into effect. Effect. Very often I had the Cape Town staff with me in my car driving around Cape Town, taking them to the deeds office and to the magistrate's court and to the high court and to the civic center and all over the show to show them how things work, took them to different estates and body corporates and managing agents offices to introduce them to um, what the CSOS calls as stakeholders. Now, the CSOS has been around for quite a while, the legislation coming out on the 7th of October 2016, and since that time, many practice directives have been handed down. Practice directives indicate what the Community Scheme Ombud Service uh, procedurally deals with, and of course, their interpretation of the legislation. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, as there always is a but or however, my experience with the Community Scheme Ombud Service has not always been a very positive one. Although I have always remained positive, the experience has not always been a positive one. And I know that that is the case for all of you as well. However, just like taxes and the Community Scheme Ombud Service levy, we have to pay it and it is there like it or not. So it is up to us to make sure that it works correctly. And as part of that, you need to know how that process works, that if it's not working correctly, you know to say, stop, that's not how it's supposed to be done. This and this is how it is supposed to be done. And unfortunately, that isn't just with the Community Scheme Ombud Service. It's potentially in every single aspect of your life. Sometimes you need to know what the trustee should be doing or the managing agent should be doing or a service provider should be, do should be doing. And I always say in community schemes that if it doesn't feel right in all likelihood, it is not right. And that's just the simplicity of the legislation. It really is as simple as that. Now, when it comes to the community scheme ombud service, unfortunately, in our consulting department, 99.9% .9 of the time, we are only approached once the dispute has already gone to the Community Scheme Ombud Service. And sometimes it's quite far ahead into that process. Sometimes it's once the adjudication order has already been handed down. And that's obviously way too late because the next step there is either appeal to the High Court or review to the High Court. So that's a little bit too late. We often get asked to assist in the making of applications, defending of applications, attending at conciliation, attending at adjudication. And I've been quite fortunate that because I'm no longer a practicing attorney, um, I am able to help uh, clients at the Community Scheme Ombud Service through the process of concilia conciliation and adjudication. So I do get to see it literally from the ground up. However, during that process, I've also seen how things are not done correctly and how people do not even try to resolve their differences prior to going to the Community Scheme Ombud Service. 
the first thing I ask any client that approaches me in regard to a matter going to the CSOS or already at the CSOS is what have you done before you paid that whopping 50 Rand to go to the community scheme on service? Bearing in mind now that the 50 Rand and the 100 Rand fees have fallen away. So there's even... Uh, more applications that are being made because that pesky admin fee is no longer needed. Now, when it comes to a CSAS application, the application form specifically says that you must prove that you've exhausted your internal remedies. And nine times out of 10, I feel like I'm saying 99.9% .9 and nine times out of 10 a lot, but that just shows you how often it happens. When I receive an application for dispute resolution and I scroll down to the exhaustion of internal remedies, I see that not much has actually been done to resolve the problem before going to the community scheme on the service. Maybe a couple of emails were sent, maybe a meeting was requested, maybe even a meeting was held, maybe information was requested and not put forward. But very rarely is there really an attempt at exhausting your internal remedies. I don't think the legislature uh, did not have an intention by using the word exhaust. And if you had to go and have a look at the dictionary definition of it, it's not simply, eh, you know, maybe I'll give this person a quick telephone call and if they don't answer, you know, I've done everything I possibly can do. It is trying every single avenue that is reasonably available to you and you're reasonably able to uh, pursue in order to resolve an issue. Now, I'm no stranger to sectional title disputes in my personal capacity. Many of you will know that I've only ever lived in sectional title or homeowners associations, uh, quite a number of them. And of course, in that time, I have encountered my fair share of disputes, either with neighbors, being a noisy neighbor or dealing with a noisy neighbor. And if I had to receive a letter from the managing agent to complain about a barking dog or whatever it might be, um, I would first say, why didn't that complaining owner come and talk to me? They live right next to me or they live right below me. I'm home most of the time. They could have rung my bell. If they're too scared to talk to me, they could have, could have put a letter underneath my door. They could have asked the managing agent for my telephone number. They could have given me a call. They could have even approached me on the common property. And, you know, that doesn't happen very often in my experience when I'm looking at these CSOS applications. I know the answer that a lot of people will have is, you know, I don't like conflict. I don't want to go and talk to the person because I'm afraid it's going to end up in a screaming match. Or I'd much rather let somebody else deal with it because I still have to live with them. I still have to see them. You know, my most embarrassing incident in a sectional title scheme was when I was chairperson of a body corporate in my personal capacity. We were having a dispute with an owner. I was parking my car in my garage. I saw him drive past his parking bay being about three bays away from mine. So I knew he was going to walk past me in my garage and I wasn't able to make it in time to the elevator because I would have probably had to share the elevator with him and no chance was I going to do that. So I locked myself in my garage. Yes, I closed the garage door on myself to make sure that when he walked past, it would look like I wasn't there. Obviously, he would think I disappeared into thin air because I wouldn't have been able to make it to my flat that quickly. But that is how I attempted to avoid conflict or communicating with this person. Very, very wrong, but that's what I did. And that's what I did as a seasoned sectional title attorney. So if I could do something as silly as that, I'm sure that people without that background and experience would do a heck of a lot more. But that doesn't mean that it's the right thing. And I regret that because even today, if I go and visit that block, I still am not able to say hello to that person and he's still there. Um, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a good feeling to know that you can't really bump into somebody on the common property because you've had this nasty episode with them. And if I'd simply spoken to him and tried to resolve the differences, perhaps it would have been completely different. I'm sure it would have been completely different. That being said, we did end up going to the community scheme on bit service and it did end up being a protracted fight and all those fun things. And that could have been avoided. So what are the steps that you can take to exhaust your internal remedies? Of course, it depends on who you are. If you're the applicant or the respondent, if you're an owner, a tenant, the managing agent, a trustee, those are the considerations that you have to take or rather take into consideration. 
on my view on Zoom now, I can see Shirley Bailey. And I know that one of the things that she has done in order to internally deal with her dispute resolution is that she makes sure that she is invited to and she attends and she prepares for every single trustee meeting. So she goes to a trustee meeting, whether or not the trustees like it or not, that she's able to speak to the trustees, as opposed to taking them to the community scheme on the service. She went to an annual general meeting and she asked me to attend with her, but she spoke for herself and she raised her concerns amongst her fellow members, obtained support, and in that way was able to deal with a lot of things. She ensures that she's got a good relationship with the managing agent and the complex manager, that when something arises that she believes is um, a concern for her, that she's able to address it directly with the relevant people, as opposed to going to the community scheme ombud service. That being said, when she has gone to the community scheme ombud service, she kicked her body corporate's butt and won the case. But she did try a heck of a lot before she actually made that step to go to the community scheme ombud service. So it's not simply an email to say, hey, I've got a problem, I'm going to get my lawyer on you, or can I come to a trustee meeting, but then never ever go, or ask for records, but then don't follow it up. You have to really try to exhaust your internal remedies or your, um, your the available recourse to you. Now, in most instances, the body corporate rules, if it's prescribed or if it's amended, it doesn't set out a process for internal dispute resolution. In the conduct rules and the management rules that Nicole and I draw for our clients, we do put an internal dispute resolution process in there. And it can literally be as simple as, number one, a written complaint with evidence, a request for a meeting, attendance at a meeting, getting support to call a special general meeting if necessary, engaging with the managing agent, putting everything on record, and if you're still not able to succeed, then going the route of the community scheme on the service. Now, once you're at the community scheme on the service, that doesn't mean that you no longer have to try to resolve issues prior to um, it being dealt with during conciliation and adjudication. And unfortunately, my experience has been that a matter can most certainly get resolved in the long spaces of time for the matter to actually get resolved at the CSOS. I have to admit, and Nicole will agree, that the timelines of the CSOS has most certainly gotten better in recent times. However, there are a lot of outstanding matters that are simply that outstanding. I've been following up for a client, he may or may not be online this morning, that has waited more than one year between the conciliation and the adjudication. Uh, and the CSAR says that if the applicant does not indicate their intention to proceed with adjudication within 30 days, the file should be closed. So I ask with tears in my eyes, why on earth is a year um, still, is the matter still being dealt with one year down the line when it should have been closed 11 months prior? So these are the types of things that we have to pick up. That being said, not everybody is capable or willing or able to resolve their matters internally, or they really have tried what they believe is reasonable to resolve issues. And it really does depend on who you are, the nature of your scheme, and of course, the nature of the people that you're dealing with. Sometimes you're going to ask 10 times for a meeting and the trustees are simply going to deny it on every single front. Or you are going to go to a trustee meeting, but you're going to be muted every single time you try to say something. It's as simple as that. Sometimes you do need help. But perhaps there's an opportunity to try to resolve matters outside of the community scheme on service. I know that in terms of the sectional title schemes management act, arbitration is no longer a thing. If you're in a homeowners association, your constitution or your memoranda might still apply, um, apply arbitrations. But we also know that arbitrations in the normal course is very time consuming and very expensive, almost as time consuming as ex and expensive as court proceedings. And nobody wants that. Nobody's got a budget for legal fees. Trust me, I don't. Um, so we are looking at starting what we call an informal dispute resolution process, not internal because it's not within your scheme. That is something that your scheme needs to put in place or you need to put in place with or without guidance, but rather informal dispute resolution where there won't be any formal award that you can make an order of court or spend more money on, but simply 
putting people in a room to try to resolve a difference. And I can also say, and for those of you that have had a lot of disputes um, at the CSOS and NETS, I know that you and Mike have had a lot of experience with the Community Scheme Ombud Service, and I'm sure that you'll admit as well that now dealing with disputes over the telephone and dealing with it on the papers is most certainly a lot more difficult um, than dealing with it face-to-face. -face. I found that in the days of having face-to-face -face adjudications and conciliations, that matters used to resolve themselves a heck of a lot easier than on, in, on the telephone or um, on written papers. I mean, I tell my clients, you know what, if you believe that the application is not going to, or conciliation rather, is not going to succeed, all you need to say as the applicant is, I don't foresee that this being is going to be resolved, and I would prefer the matter to go to adjudication, Bob's your uncle, if it goes to adjudication. And unfortunately, with adjudication it being on the papers, you can have attorneys and advocates that are drafting papers against you, and not everybody has the money or the uh, um, or the willingness to go down that route. And why are we turning the community scheme on the service into a court of law in any event? It's most certainly um, not my intention, and I'm sure it's not your intentions, the intention as owners and trustees and managing agents either. Something that we're going to chat about um, a lot more extensively during We Connect You, we Connect You's masterclass is the role of the managing agent um, in the dispute resolution process. And speaking as a previous managing agent, I know that very often as portfolio managers, you are um, assumed to take on the role of the applicant or the respondent in these proceedings. And it really isn't your place. Yes, you know the day-to-day -day management and affairs of the body corporate or the HA or the community scheme. I mean, you sign uh, affidavits in levy collection matters to say that you've got that intimate knowledge. So why not with CSOS adjudications? But it's not part of your management. It's not part of uh, sometimes your skill set and most certainly not part of the little bit of time you have to allocate to each of your community schemes. So together we need to find a simpler, more cost-effective process. And yes, the CSOS only cost us 50 Rand and 100 Rand. Unfortunately, in order to ensure that that process is done correctly, very often we have found that people are needing to outsource assistance off consultants and attorneys and advocates and all those fun things. And these proceedings become very, very expensive. There's also no opportunity to recover costs. I remember being part of one of the very first CSOS orders and one of the only times the Community Scheme Ombud Service made an order that every single cent of cost needed to be refunded to my client. And that was legal fees and engineering costs and all sorts of fun things. That doesn't happen anymore. So there needs to be a process where costs are being saved, but more importantly, the outcome is, is being, um, the outcome that is being put forward is correct, not only in accordance with the legislation or the governance documentation of your community scheme, but more importantly, procedure. And I'm finding, looking at these processes at the CSOS and looking at these adjudication orders, that the law is being applied correctly most often, but the procedure most certainly isn't correct. I've dealt with instances where, um, and I'm sure that my invitation to Friday and Saturday CSOS uh, training might be revoked uh, based on my list that is ever growing of questions that I'm wanting to ask and points that I'm wanting to make. And I'm going to be going with Shirley on Friday and I'm sure she's going to want to seat, sit at least 10 rows away from me. Like, I don't know that person um, and might desert me there, but we'll see. Um, Shirley, I'll buy you a very nice cup of coffee in time. Um, when it comes to some of the things that I've seen, it, it makes me want to pull my hair out and uh, pregnancy has already done that to me, so I don't still need the CSOS to do that as well. But there are things like, I know for a fact I've submitted written submissions on behalf of my clients. And when I get the adjudication order handed down, it says the respondent or the applicant has not submitted anything. Like, how does that work? Or the file is empty, even though I know that I've submitted 100 attachments or I only know who the adjudicator is the moment the adjudication order is handed down. Where are the days where we had a list of the adjudicators that we could look into them to see whether or not they would be most suitable to our matter? Um, where are the days that we could engage, that we were both copied in as parties? I'm finding more and more often that the processes are not done correctly. And trust me, I've got nothing against the Community Scheme Ombud Service. I am incredibly fond of the people that work there, 
especially the Western Cape office. Um, and I have the utmost respect for them. I can't imagine how difficult their jobs are. But they are dealing with a very, very important industry. And they're dealing with our homes, our livelihoods, our investments. And it's incredibly frustrating when procedurally things aren't done correctly, especially when the legislation is as simple as what it is. And my goal for this year and going forward is to assist as many people as I can, firstly, in not having to go to the Community Scheme Ombud Service, because this Community Scheme Ombud Service is being funded in any event. You don't have to go to them to fund them. But to reserve the Community Scheme Ombud Service for those matters that really cannot get resolved, as opposed to bogging them down with matters that are relatively simple and sometimes are based simply on mis understanding. So to resolve it internally, first and foremost, if not internally, at least informally, by agreement, by parties getting together and understanding each other's basis, and more importantly, understanding the law and seeing it in black and white. I want a special resolution. No, the body corporate says you need a unanimous resolution. Okay, I'm going to the CSOS because you're not giving me my special resolution. The act says it needs a unanimous resolution. Okay, fine. I see the act says it needs unanimous resolution. Perfect. No need to go to the CSOS anymore. Something as simple as that. So I hope as an industry, we can work together to ensure that these processes are uh, dealt with correctly. And with that comes education. With that comes knowing what the Community Scheme Ombud Service is there for, what their parameters are, what their processes are, and asking the questions and raising your points of concern before it's too late. Because once that order has been handed down or once your matter has been dismissed, it is too late. And then unfortunately, there is a case of winner and loser, and we're not wanting to get to that point. Um, our, Nicole and our ex-employer at Pam Golding, uh, Mike Murray, who's going to be joining us next month um, on our February webinar, actually taught us something that I will never forget, and that is reaching a point where both parties are equally unhappy. It always sounded terrible, but if you really come down to think about it, there really is no winner when it comes to disputes. Somebody or both parties are always going to be unhappy with the outcome. There never really is a winner per se. So let's work together to find a resolution where potentially we can both be a little bit unhappy, but both at the end of the day get what we want, the dispute resolved. I'd be very interested to hear um, we've got about 15 minutes left um, from all of you, you know, what type of incidents you've had. If you don't want to raise it verbally now, you're more than welcome to pop it on the chat or send me an email. I've asked many times on um, our social media platforms for your stories, horror or not. And I'm always very happy to see how many positive stories there are. But at the same time, when there is something negative, it's quite a whopper. And uh, I'm hoping that those numbers can come down. I am only one person. Nicole and I make one full person sometimes, I think. So we do need the rest of you to assist in this process, even if it is just sharing your experiences. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to shut up for a couple of minutes, which doesn't happen very often. And I'd like you to please share your experiences uh, with us now in the chat function. And then I'll have a look if there's a couple of questions as well. So over to you. Come now, I know some of you have got some horror experiences. Okay, let me start. Um, <laughs> firstly, I am one that wishes to avoid CSOS like the plague when it comes to disputes, um, for, enough, for obvious reasons. But I'm a firm believer in internal dispute resolutions. And I have successfully done that, much to the trustees' reluctance to engage. Nonetheless, when you bring the parties together and you basically brief them about what the intention is and you start by asking them to take the emotion out of the situation, more than not, you get a meet and achieve, you achieve a meeting of the minds. Um, yeah, there's no winner, there's no loser. Both lose is the degree of the loss that is incurred. So I fully support what you say there. Now, having said all that, in all the years that I have done that, I'm facing one particular problem now with, uh, so I'm not going to ask for, uh, it potentially it could become a dispute, but I hope not, 
it's just an unauthorized structure that has gone up. It's sectional title, exclusive use area. Uh, owner did not take, get permission, not that the permission would have been given for this horribly aesthetic looking apparatus that he put up. Um, so we've asked for a meeting because the emails are not working out. Uh, but failing that, could the could we as the body corporate or the trust, trustees just step in and take that thing down? Unfortunately not, because that would be taking the law into your own hands. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, this is one of the things that could so easily and quickly be resolved if the procedures at the Community Scheme Ombud Service were, de were being dealt with correctly. You know, when they started, um, Tony, they were supposed to have different channels, you know, for urgent matters, mm. for matters that weren't really part of a dispute, uh, like levy collection matters. Are you paying your levy? No, you're not. Off you go. You know, you have to pay your levy type of thing. And the example that you use now is perfect, because what's going to happen is you're going to make the application in all likelihood likelihood before you even get very far at the CSOS the the um, the person that is uh, breaching the rules might sell their unit now you have to deal with the purchaser that bought it like that or they might even decide to remove the object and you've incurred your time and potentially you've appointed an attorney to help you with the application you've incurred costs that you can't recover so something as simple as that should be able to be dealt with relatively quickly at the CSOS but unfortunately it's not but no you can't just do it yourself um, I always have a tongue-in-cheek answer and I say whatever you do in the middle of the night that no one can see no one can blame you for um but uh, i wouldn't recommend it no. <laughs> no we've got a couple of uh, comments on the on the chat function um, there was a question uh, that says, we have just engaged our lawyers to send a letter to an owner who has refused to address behavioral issues of his tenants for three years. I mean, see how long something like that is taking. Are you saying that we must use the CSOS? So no, you don't have to use the CSOS. Of course, if it is something that falls within the jurisdiction of the CSOS and your internal dispute remedies are not working, then you must go the route of the CSOS. But if it's something that the court can deal with and not the community scheme on but service, you can go that way. But the point of today's discussion is to not have to go to court or not have to go to CSOS, but rather resolve issues internally. I mean, the example that's proposed that the owner has refused to deal with the behavioral issues for a period of three years, I think that is exhaustion of internal remedies. Unless, of course, you've only sent one letter in three years. But if you've dealt with it regularly over a three-year period, that's something completely different. There's yeah, Zalinda, sorry, just to add to what I'd put in the in the chat. Um, no, we send a letter every time there is a serious behavioral issue and we get zero response from the owner who does not spend much time in this country and uh, we refuse to uh, here I'm saying we refuse to, and you're saying you shouldn't, but we refuse to engage with the tenants uh, because they are aggressive and uh, people are quite frankly afraid of them. You know, I mean, what do, what do you do in a case like that? Yeah. Um, I as I said, our, our managing agent said, um, we must uh, get a legal letter sent to them. And hopefully the legal letter actually gives them a wake up call. Hope so, I hope so. Very often we find that the legal letter doesn't do that. It's simply that it's just a letter that is sometimes not opened. I'm sure there's many of you that uh, leave a WhatsApp message unread because you simply don't want to deal with the contents of it. It's exactly the same as a legal letter. Um, there's, if there's nothing going to come from that, it's really going to mean nothing. Um, with a situation like that, I mean, it all does come down to your rules and your rules have to allow for enforcement, for example, fines. Now, fines used to be a fantastic thing until the CSOS practice directive stating that a fining amount cannot be equal to or more than a monthly levy, and that just threw that out of the water. So there has to be a way to resolve these types of issues, and if the behavior is severe enough, perhaps even getting um, law enforcement involved. You know, that's something to have a look at. Of course, landlords are responsible for their tenants, and the body corporate can't become involved in that relationship. They can't 
avoid evict tenants, for example. And I've seen, uh, Nicole and I have seen quite a few rules that do attempt to do that. We can't do that, unfortunately. But something that has been coming along for that long with you, you can't afford to go and sit at the CSOS for an equal amount of time. So you need to know the processes in order to chase that process along. Quite a few of you, um, Marion, yourself, thank you very much, have sent me a couple of orders um, where it's, they've just gotten it horribly wrong. Um, but unfortunately, the body corporate is restrained from taking it further and it's simply accepted. And it starts off with something minor that just escalates absolutely terribly. Um, so one really needs to know what's going on before you take a matter to the CSOS and find out whether or not it in fact has to go that way. Marion, I see your hand up. Yes, um, I, I'm sure you don't want to talk about the specific cases here, but just um, in general terms, I'd, I'd just like to bring this up here. But where our impression is that the adjudicator is, well, first, first of, the first thing that is disturbing is that spelling and grammar and things like that are really bad. Um, all right, but you know, we do, I do understand some people don't have English as their first language, but you would still think there would be some quality control on these things. But the adjudicator appears to just not understand the law and to have just misinterpreted. And um, yeah, although I know formally you, you can't comment on this, Linda, but I'm interested you just said where they seem to have just got it wrong. Um, is there, yeah, is there no quality control? And um, unfortunately, I worked for government for quite a long time and no document left the building without being signed off by, by a, a senior person or another senior person. And I just feel that if these adjudications, instead of coming straight from who appears to be an ill-informed Ill adjudicator straight to us, had gone to, at least gone to somebody else for double checking. Is, it, is, there no, is this still happening for one question? Because these were a year or two ago. And secondly, do, the, is, do we have any comeback to CSOS with, with just poor quality work? So it's, unfortunately, it's very much still happening. <laughs> Um, Marion, I'd love to tell you it's not, but we wouldn't be talking about this topic if it got any better. Um, I have noticed recently on the adjudication orders that there is a space for quality assurance and who that quality assurer is. Um, my understanding is that the quality assurance is um, another adjudicator, if I'm starting to know the names a little bit. Um, but it should, in my opinion, it should be an external party with a skill set in the particular matter. So if it's a financial matter, it should be an accountant or an auditor. If it's a legal matter, it should be an attorney. If it is a engineering matter, it should be an engineer. I mean, if you look at the arbitration clauses in constitutions or memorandums of incorporation, it specifically sets out if this is a legal matter, an attorney of 10 years standing will be, if this is a financial matter, an auditor will be used, et cetera, et cetera. Why the adjudication orders don't follow that route, um, you know, I don't know. So it is supposed to be quality assured. And what is the recourse if something happens? That's an answer I want myself, because sometimes we're told to take the matter on review to court, and other times the matter is referred to a new adjudicator. Sometimes the ombuds become involved and sometimes they don't. Sometimes a new application is started and sometimes it isn't. So it's, and then I've argued both ways. I've argued for fresh adjudication proceedings and I've argued against fresh adjudication proceedings, but that's my line of work. But there should be a standard and that is what it is. And unfortunately, it shouldn't have to resort to having to incur the cost of going to high court for a review. Definitely not. Um, Sandy, I saw your hand was up earlier, but you've put it down since. Is there something that you wanted to ask? Um, Fiona, I just wanted to say something, but you've only got four minutes. So I'll explain in oh, detail yeah. next time or send you a note so you've got it. So we're dealing with a situation where a owner wants to actually try and take a... Um, uh, a plumber to the board, the plumbing board, and uh, uh, remove his license. So basically, what's so I'm hearing feedback. Okay, so the, so uh, she basically wants to take um, the plumber's uh, license away, based on the fact there's two plumbing boards um, organization that regulate plumbers. The one is more lenient, the other one's very stringent. And um, she got a second plumber in to get a COC, and the second plumber followed the more stringent one. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this pans out. It's not a matter for CSOS, but 
interesting to see how different bodies come into play when it comes to geezers and um, insurance and that kind of thing. Yeah. Thanks. That's, that's an interesting point that you raised. But first, I would just like to say, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost at 11 o'clock and I don't want to keep any of you away from the Women in Sectional Title webinar that's happening at 11 o'clock. So if you'd like to jump off and join that, please do be my guest. Uh, Nicole, that goes for you as well, as well as uh, Toby. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Toby. I really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to uh, the masterclass and we'll be sharing that, uh, those details. Thank you, Zelinda. Look forward to seeing you there as well. Bye. Great stuff. For those of you that have a couple of questions, I see there's still quite a few hands up. We are going to uh, stay online for a couple of minutes. But please, ladies and gents, if you would like to jump off to go to the WISC webinar or to continue your day at work, please don't feel um, bad or guilty at all. I don't mind at all. You're more than welcome to jump off. If you'd like to pop us a message in the chat function or uh, send an email or a WhatsApp, you're more than welcome to. Um, for those of you that have your hands raised, uh, Derek and Caroline, I see your hands up. Derek, shall we deal with you first? Yes, Zelinda, just um, just a quick one. I think it's important for everyone to know. Um, I'm totally supportive of internal, of trying to resolve a dispute internally before going to CSOS, because unfortunately nobody wins. Um, Nobody wins. If, it, if a decision gets made formally, like being made in a court of law, sometimes it might be the correct uh, order, sometimes not, but there will always be animosity um, within the scheme. Oh, we, we went to CSOS and we won from whichever party, whether it's from the trustee board or from the owners. However, one thing I do have, and I think it's important to note, um, Zelinda, and, and I, I think this is for another discussion, but I'll put it out there, is, is now with the pandemic, and yes, we're hopefully getting past it, but now with the pandemic, we sit with the, with the way that they changed how adjudication or uh, hearings are being heard. And not many people are not skilled in writing an application. Um, knowing that it's going to be heard on paper eventually. Yeah. And that's vitally important. So it's all submitted on the fact that there's going to be a in-person hearing um, and that does not happen. Mm -hmm. And then that changes the process. Yeah. However, what I failed to understand is from CSOS is how they will have a conciliation hearing um, or session via electronic means, via Teams or however telephone call. But that process cannot be done from an adjudication perspective. So one, the adjudicator wasn't part of what happened in the conciliation hearing um, and then goes to make an order or review or dismiss or whatever based on written submissions. Mm -hmm. And that I feel that even from a pandemic perspective, there should be no logical reason why the adjudication cannot be held by um, teams format or yeah. whatever, because it allows every party, because often what is in writing is not actually truly reflective of what the issue at hand is or the complaint is. Yeah. So I just want to leave it out there because yeah. that's a big concern I have. And of the orders that I've reviewed and with my, my experience, I look at it and I say, the adjudication order doesn't lend to the facts um, that was presented. And that is a concern. Anyway. I thought I'd, I'd put that out there. <laughs> you know, it's it's still positive when the facts that are presented are in fact brought in front of the adjudicator. But my, you know, the really scary thing is is when you read an adjudication order where the incorrect facts are noted, the insufficient facts are noted, or it simply says there is nothing on file when there clearly is. Um, you know, those those types yeah. of things can't happen. It most certainly can't happen. Now, the latest practice directive does make it possible to have an application for having an adjudication via Microsoft Teams. It is not as um, conducive as a face-to-face, -face, in my opinion. There's just something about being in a room with the other person or across the table from another person that really does help uh, resolutions. Uh, I don't know what it is about humans. We, we call them keyboard warriors. You know, if you're behind a computer screen or you're behind a, a keyboard, it's much easier to be aggressive and fight than if you are dealing with someone face-to-face. -face. Conciliations that are held over teleconference facilities, in my opinion, are 
are very poor. Um, the quality of the call is poor. There's always background noise. There's people that struggle to get onto the telephone call. You have your little speech rehearsed. Um, you know, you miss out on a lot of the dynamics of the conversation. So having it face to face is most certainly preferable. But in the time of COVID, and if we can't have physical meetings, then having it like this is uh, much better than the written form. Um, me, myself, that has the skill in writing, I don't enjoy it. So when I have to do written submissions, I don't enjoy doing it. And I do still feel that a lot is lacking. Um, and you also need to be so careful that you don't throw all the information or all the supporting documents to the adjudicator. There is a real skill in bringing it down to what the relevant points are, which you're quite right, a lot of people don't have. Caroline, you've got your hand up for quite a while. Good morning, Zelinda. Thank you for this is a very, very um, important and relevant topic. So thank you for this. I'm glad. Um, I fully concur with Derek and Marion with regards to certain um, uh, with regards to quality of adjudications and procedures. Um, and it certainly doesn't apply to all adjudicators or adjudications, but mm -hmm. there are certainly instances where adjudicators are not fully a fay with the law of sectional title um, schemes and they are making errors in law and the adjudications in certain instances are being treated as mediations as opposed to adjudications and the strict, and the strict application of law, which is a massive problem because at the end of the day, the reason we are approaching or people are approaching CSOS is for the law to be applied. Um, and then also in the conciliation process, the conciliators should be skilled and a favor with the law enough to be making the, the legal um, guidance in those discussions as opposed to where the parties could effectively be ag agreeing to something to move forward on which is not legally correct in any case and then also with Derek's comment around transparent um, adjudications is absolutely essential because there are misrepresented facts which are being sent and documented. Um, it's resulting in misinterpretation of information. And there's also evidence which is not a very important and relevant information that in instances is not being considered. So there's, there's massive room for, for improvement and um, quality control in terms of adjudications, which you know, to your point up front, you're affecting people's homes, investments, and livelihoods, and these orders are affecting those, those matters. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. You know, we've, um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of or on that um, sectional title living in South Africa group on Facebook. It's got almost 10,000 members, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And I look at the, the questions that are asked there, um, and I see a couple of familiar names. Daisy, I, I know your name from the group. Um, I so wish that the Community Scheme Ombud Service would be on that group. They don't have to post because I'm sure that they would be completely inundated, but I wish there was somebody, um, a relevant person that would be on that group to have a look. And I can't tell you how many times I alert them to some of the conversations that are happening there um, in a way to get them to address these issues. And instead of welcoming groups like that and welcoming the comments on groups like that to improve the service and to assist them, it's very often seen as, you know, why don't they just come and talk to us as opposed to posting it on a group on social media. It's not a, it's, 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 I don't believe that that group should be seen as complaining. The group is being seen as looking for help and trying to get answers, the answers that their people are not getting from the community scheme ombud service where they should be going to go and get those answers. And it's learning from experience as well. Um, Professor Graham Paddock in his latest uh, Paddock Press has put out that he's compiling a book along with Professor Van Amadov of adjudication orders. And, you know, that's the first stop that you should go to when you are dealing with an application that you're wanting to complete is going to look for an order dealing with a similar matter that you can see what to do and sometimes more importantly, what not to do in order to get to the outcome that you seek. But again, it shouldn't have to rely on you to do this type of research. And very often people cannot do it for whatever reason. The CSAR should be doing it right the first time around. Shirley, you've got your hand up. You're on mute. You did say that I'm very good about in, uh, engaging with the trustees and so on. I, but we don't have any internal resolution set in the conduct rules because they they did them about two years ago and never 
informed that it never got them approved. And I do have an internal dispute, um, which I, I think is a great idea. I need to actually have a meeting with these trustees. How, if we don't have a, a format, then what is the best way to go? To send a letter to the trustees saying, I'd like to meet with you over certain issues? Or how, because I've actually not thought about it. I try and deal with it in trustees meetings, but they do cut me off. Yeah. So, you know, the best route would be to attend trustee meetings, which you do go to. Now, nobody likes to be ambushed at a meeting. So I would always suggest that your concerns are at least noted beforehand to the trustees, that they have an opportunity to, to, to prepare for it. Um, and you should be working through the managing agent. Um, that should be, uh, you know, unbiased. Um, unfortunately, it is difficult for managing agents because at the end of the day, your boss is the trustees that change sometimes day to day. Um, and if you say something that they don't like, you're going to be out of there very quickly and replaced by somebody that's going to say something that you do like. So it is a difficult position to be in, but ultimately it does rest with the trustees. If you're not getting joy that way, it would be to involve an independent person to help conciliate or to mediate or to facilitate or any of those eights. Um, you know, there isn't a set process or a formal process. It's whatever works for you, the people that you're dealing with in the scheme that you're in. But sometimes you do need to have a third party, somebody that doesn't have a vested interest. I often find that a lot of schemes will do good by having an external trustee, somebody that doesn't have a vested interest, somebody that is not emotionally attached to the building or to any issues that are surrounding it. But unfortunately, most often, external trustees come at a cost. But whichever way you look at it, a dispute is going to cost somebody something. So to have procedures in place, like you mentioned, the body corporate doesn't have those procedures in place is step one. And to involve somebody external and independent is step two. And if that is not able to resolve matters um, internally or outside of the CSOS, well, then it's to go the community scheme on the service route. Like I'm not saying that all matters cannot be resolved through the CSOS or matters should not be resolved through the CSOS. I'm just saying that when it is possible to not resolve matters through the CSOS, mm. there must be ways and means for people to resolve it without having to go that recourse. Before CSOS, you had to do it. So why should it be any different now? Not everybody could afford to go to the magistrate's court or the high court, that's for sure, or to go to a lawyer. So there, there is most certainly a time and place for internal dispute resolution. Ladies and gentlemen, we've uh, exceeded our time quite exponentially. I know that there are one or two questions um, on the group or the chat function too, and I'm going to try to engage with you directly to deal with those. Um, is there anybody else that would like to say anything verbally while we're online? Otherwise, uh, we'll end it there. All right. Fantastic. Ladies and gents, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in February. Like I said, we're going to have Mike Perea of Pam Golding Property Management Services join us next month. It's going to be financially orientated, something I know nothing about. So uh, that'll be quite exciting. Uh, Shirley, I'll see you on Friday. And for those of you that are going to be at the CSOS event on Friday and or Saturday, I'll see you there. For those of you that are going to be Zooming in or Microsoft Teamsing in, um, I'll wave to you. And and uh, I might have to walk home on Friday if Shirley's too embarrassed. No, no, no. I'll be with you all the way. <laughs> Fantastic. Ladies and gents, thank you so much. Have a lovely day further and keep well. Bye-bye. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Paul.